and and also uh, when um, when I was still a very um, technical um, AI researcher myself, um, and then uh, and, and then there's one time when I um, attend a conference called the International Conference on Cognitive Science, where what well, it happens in Beijing, um, where me, me and Vincent uh, uh, actually um, meet each other. Um, and then Vincent was, of course, a, not only a philosopher, um, but in many ways knows a lot deeper uh, on AI compared to uh, my other philosophy friends in China uh, many, and many other places. Uh, but, but something most interestingly for me later is that uh, Vincent told me that, E, you have a theory about uh, what you call brains by the AI. So I could see some philosophy right there. Would you like to uh, give a keynote in my conference on philosophy and theory of AI, uh, where I learned a lot through interactions with many of the philosophers right there. I must do quick, in a very quick way to share two stories. Uh, when I attend the conference at Leeds, uh, when, when Vincent was still in Leeds. Um, story number one is that it was around the, the time of AlphaGo. So basically, uh, when I visited the city, I saw some interesting old um, um, senior age uh, man, and then to actually to uh, having chats uh, the, uh, together. So I was, uh, so I, I was, I think at that time I was a little bit annoying to challenge them saying that, so do you know about AlphaGo? And they were like, oh yeah, of course, but it, it has nothing to do with me because I just enjoy my way to play the chess. So um, so I, I think this is the spirit from the, from the human society uh, really to have another perspective, not, not as a replacement by uh, AI. So uh, there's a lot of, thing, lot of things that uh, has to go deep uh, to think about, I guess. Um, my, uh, my second story uh, is also on that conference, uh, that's, um, I think is a, a very senior age, the professor from, uh, from Lubinijana. He was like, hey bro, so uh, why are you in this conference? I was like, uh, well, of course uh, you need philosophy to build the right AI for the future. And, and this interesting um, gentleman was like, so, um, you shouldn't have this kind of idea at your age. So I was like, um, uh, so why are you in this conference? And then he was like, um, I've already told you the right sense of building AI come with age. So, so that is uh, the, the reason that uh, he, come, he came to philosophy and AI um, conferences. And, and, Starting as the technician, but also later moved to more philosophical perspective of, uh, of AI. That's of course not a good introduction of Vincent, um, but it was a philosophy, the, the, the bridge of philosophy and uh, technical AI that bring us uh, together, where Vincent also helped me to establish my course on philosophy uh, and ethics of AI uh, in China. Now it's been the fifth version in my University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, where I learned a lot from Vincent's uh, previous experience uh, for teaching a similar course uh, in Greece. So Vincent did um, going across many continents um, to do the research and congratulations again to Vincent's um, uh, recently uh, huge award uh, for, for not only for his previous work, but very hopefully uh, to the bright future of his uh, uh, future research. So Vincent, the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, you for that personal introduction. That was 
interesting for me too. So, yes, um, when I was asked to, to talk at this panel, I got a little worried because I don't have a proper academic talk to present about cross-cultural trust. And I explained in my response email what I am worried about. And then he basically said, why don't you talk about those worries? And that might be an interesting aspect of the discussion. So I, I think I will try to do that. Um, so the worry is, broadly speaking, in the um, in the landscape that, that Professor uh, Jill has, has, has opened. So the, what between the global and the local, and how do we handle this kind of uh, situation? Do we want to have one, one size fits all, or do we have some kind of adjustment, or how does, how does this, do these kind of things work? Um, so because this is ethics, um, I thought one aspect of that is to look at uh, something that one teaches typically in introductory classes to ethics, which is uh, one solution to this, which is called cultural relativism. And I think it's important to get a quick grip on, on, that, on that notion. So a cultural relativist is somebody who says um, there are all sorts of different norms in the world. Different places have different norms on all sorts of things. Um, so there isn't such a thing as the one right norm. And perhaps if you say that there's such a thing as the right, right norm, it's really bad because it is colonialist or suppressing other people's norms anyway. Uh, and obviously we have historical examples of that happening. Uh, I think it's important to realize that that's a fallacy. So uh, the fact that people have different norms in different places or in different times uh, doesn't show that there isn't such a thing as a right norm in some space. So for example, um, in Europe, not that long ago, people used to think that uh, women should not have power over anything important and they should not be taken seriously intellectually. So that stance, I think, has turned out to be false. So it's not just that I would say, oh, this is done like this or like that in different cultures. And in some cultures, that's still how things are. But I, I would say the correct response to that is to say, uh, some cultures are making a mistake in that area, and some don't. So it's important in this context to, uh, to distinguish between the, the aspects of ethics, which are normative, and the, as and the other aspects of the world, which are descriptive. Um, and quite a lot of the apparent cultural uh, differences aren't because of different ethics, but they are because of different beliefs about the world. Um, so let's say a classic example of this kind of thing is, is, is burial practices. What do we do with people when they die? So in different cultures, there are different things that one does with the dead, right? You put them into a hole in the ground uh, or you burn them or various other things that people do. Um, and typically, if one person speaks to another person, says, "Oh, you're you really you put you dig a hole in the ground, you put your grandmother in there. Isn't that a horrible thing to do?" And the other person says, "Well, no, that's fine. That's you, you burn them. How awful is that?" So you you get the impression that there is a a significant cultural conflict there, um, but there isn't. What's actually happening is that these two people share an important view, namely that one should do an imp a, a ceremonial respectful thing with the dead. So we don't throw the dead in the rubbish. No culture does that, right? But we have an agreement, in other words, on a, on a more fundamental level that the correct way to deal with the dead is to show them our respect and to follow whatever happens to be our beliefs on what has to happen for that to occur. Uh, so that could be burying, burning, or whatever, right? And while you're doing this, specific things have to happen a certain 
I don't know, a priest has to show up or something like that, right? Some important things have to happen. So, so what you what you get, it seems to me, is, is that the differences that you observe are quite often superficial. So you think the other people are really, really different from you because they behave differently in some way. But I think one important aspect of that kind of conversation when you speak more to people from different cultures is that they're not as different as you might think. And the fundamental views, but they fundamentally care about and their fundamental ethics is actually the same. Um, so it seems to me that that is sort of a basis for, for the kind of uh, work that we can do here. We can try to see which are the fundamental things that we share and, and where are, the, where are the, the points of divergence. I think uh, an important notion in that context is the notion that Immanuel Kant has introduced into ethics, and that's the notion of respect. So he suggests that um, we should have respect to ourselves and to other people. And that notion of respect implies some things. So let's say I see someone, I don't know, I see a friend of mine having a conversation with someone and, and this friend of mine has a conversation and disagrees with someone. And then they say to them, uh, you're an idiot. And if you don't shut up, I'll hit you over the head. Um, getting really angry about this thing, right? So now the question is, how to, do I treat this friend respectfully? It seems to me that it is a, if, this, if this is just some guy, right? At whom I see doing this, I might say, okay, that's obviously an idiot. I'm not going to have any, uh, anything to do with them. Okay, I will not treat them with respect. If they, this, this is somebody I know, I think the respectful way to treat them is to say, why did that happen? And don't you think this was a little bit problematic? And try to speak to them, speak to them and criticize them perhaps, right? So criticism is actually a sign of respect. It seems to me. So, uh, since we're talking about cross-cultural situations and we're we're talking between China and other places, uh, I think it is important that we realize that some parts of Chinese politics, for example, are worrying for people in Europe and elsewhere. And I think it's a sign of respect to say that yes, we are worried about that, uh, and we should talk about those things. So. When you're, when you're showing respect, I think there are these two aspects that this can have. The one is the dialogue and the criticism part, and the other one is the tolerance part. Right? So you can say, okay, yes, you behave I don't know, like this. You find it, I don't know, let's say, inappropriate for your wife to meet male friends at the house. Um, Okay, that's not the way I would do it in my culture, but if that is the way you do it in your culture and she's happy with that, then I should respect this. Right? That is the way you're doing it. And that is that is then fine. So I would then so that's a difference between tolerance and criticism. So tolerance implies that I think what you're doing is wrong. Right? Otherwise I wouldn't have to tolerate it. So so tolerance is already a a position that implies a certain universality. So I, I think that my, this, I have this view, I think this is the right view, you have a different one, but I will tolerate it. And I will perhaps fight for you having that, having that ability. So in Europe, the classic tolerance is religious tolerance, right? So Voltaire says, I will fight for, for your right to have the wrong opinion. So, so that is, the, that is the important part of tolerance. Um, so I think the interesting question for uh, AI ethics is, in other words, how do we balance these two things? When, when is the right situation for tolerance of difference? And when is the right situation for criticism and dialogue? That I think, these are I think the poles that we have to to look at between different uh, different cultures, and it's not an easy balance, right? So, uh, like a lot of difficult questions, it is a question of balance. So you can 
sort of err on, on both sides. You can have too much tolerance and too much criticism, and you have to find a, a proper way of balancing these things. But I think if you do respect the people that you're working with or the cultures that you're uh, uh, facing, then I think that would be the way to do this, tolerating or talking and criticizing. Very abstract remark, but it seems to me that that's a sort of the, uh, a background to our discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vincent, especially for the po points that summarizes is a major uh, considerations, which we can extend the discussions um, um, later.